So we got to know when hi Sarah, hi Han, hi Anu. Welcome to your last seminar. Your hi good morning, morning everyone. Hi, you hi. Oh, this is the last one? I thought there was one more yet or something. <clears throat> no, it's okay. today's last day. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we have Dr. Fala here. Welcome, Dr. Fala. And today's session is about AI, artificial intelligence. Um, you know, it's a very hot topic in medicine and clinical research. We want to know how AI helps human resources, but not replacing them. Like everybody's asking, if we have AI, then what we should do? Will AI replace human resource? I don't think that's the case, but let's wait for Dr. Fala to um, educate us today. Go ahead, Dr. Fala. Oh, thank you very much, Shelley, for introductions. Uh, my name is Nader, Nader Falla. I am working at the Praxis Spinal Cord Injury that our focus in the Institute is improving quality of life of people with spinal cord injury. I also have an affiliation in the Department of Medicine at the University of British Columbia. I'm an adjunct professor there also. Today, mostly I will talk for my own experience at Institute using machine learning on a spinal cord injury research. However, that can be easily generalized to any other field. I hope at least part of this uh, presentation might help you to get sense that what we are doing there and how you can use your background to involve for such a such a research and help this kind of activity. I'm going to my slides. Uh, Shelly, my slide is visible now. Am I right? Yes, yes, I see. Yes, I can see it as well. Oh, one. One. Let's. Uh, I started uh, first slide. Uh, first of all, we wanted to know what is artificial intelligence. You know, as you heard perhaps from the media or you may read by yourself, artificial intelligence demonstrates something by machine that we think they might be able to replicate what we do as a intelligence that we have for human or for animals. And what we are saying, intelligence, intelligence has so many different branches, so many different capability that human has, such as cognition or learning or problem solving or language and these kind of things. The ultimate goal for this kind of activity is we make some sort of machine that at least might be similar to us, but it might be also be better than us if it is it is something that we need to think more. Uh, so usually artificial intelligence started around 40, 1940s with uh, one of the paper that people claim that they can replicate how brain works and then it has a very great progress in the last few decades, especially when a new branch of artificial intelligence, they call it machine learnings, come to the game. And that sh it shows that uh, how we can use those technology to solve so many problems we have that it is not easy to do by regular things. And recently, last 10 years, a new part of machine learning comes that they call it deep learning. And it is uh, some uh, replication, uh, replication again of our brain. And perhaps you saw some robot that now they comes to the media and people use them such as Sophie, Sophia, that they are trying to talk same as us or think same as us. And as still they are far from what we do, but it seems we had a good progress in last few, especially last decade for make transferring and understanding intelligence for machine. Uh, 
if I wanted to show how they are connected to each other, artificial intelligence has uh, so many different branch, but we specifically focus on machine learning that related to the data because uh, because of the work I'm doing at our institute. And for deep learning, again, we have a different branch of deep learning, but I will focus again on just artificial neural network. That is the one algorithm of deep learning that I will show in our one of our example today that how we use them and how it can help us to answer some questions. If I wanted to be a little bit more specific about machine learning, usually machine learning is related to the data driven, driven models. If I wanted to compare this with a statistical paradigm that how they are different, usually in a statistical point of view, we do not uh, rely what data telling us. We have an our hypothesis and we are trying by using data to accept or reject that hypothesis. For example, if I wanted to see how age related to the outcome, it can, for example, increase the risk of death or decrease it. Usually I'm using some cut points such as 10 years, 40 to 50, 50 to 60, 60 to 70, and go on as far as I want. However, I'm not sure that's the best uh, cut point we can use. Although we assume 10 years interval for age, but it may not be the best things. Maybe when people are there 40, they are 50, they are so different when they are age of 80 or 90, as you can imagine based on your medical background. If we could use data to tell, uh, tell us that how we should, uh, for example, consider cut point for A, that might be a huge benefit of making more robust and more helpful uh, models. We do some sort of uh, machine learning activity or institute, and our goal at the institute is making uh, some clinical predictive model that help clinician, help patient, help decision maker people to use those models and have a better evaluation of system. They have a better diagnosis, better prognosis, and those kind of things. We also hope that this kind of activity we do at in our lab at uh, Praxis Institute help us to collaborate with other people, that they have a, uh, some sort of background such as you have, such as applied clinical research, that they can come and fill some gap between science, result of science, and how we should send that result to the community. How community can get benefit of our work. But how uh, machine learning has a, a publication, how much is uh, how much it was used by researchers. If you take a look at PubMed, you can see there are so many publications in other fields, especially in cancer, in neurological disease such as Alzheimer's, Huntington, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson, and those kind of things, or cardiovascular disease. They publish so many people of the papers and uh, we have something around 30,000 publications so far. However, when you take a look at our field that I'm working, a spinal cord injury, you will see very, very few papers. It means uh, still we did not use do this kind of methodology in all branch of medicine. Few branch of medicine, they had enough personnel, they had enough money to support those kind of things. But in a lot of them, we have such a gap and it might be a good opportunity to collaborate and advance our understanding of the uh, any kind of disease, especially for us uh, spinal cord injury. As I explained before, we hope that we use this uh, technique, machine learning, to have a better prediction model. And I can show, I will show in one of the example that previously people, they made some predictive model, but because they 
use part of the knowledge that was available in data they model may not be the best it might be good to collaborate with so many people with different backgrounds from clinical background from the machine learning background a statistical background computer science and as a team we could make a much stronger predictive models but what we need what we need for such a uh, project that to be sure that it's a successful at the end uh, first of all at first we need a good data it could be national could be international we need some people they have a uh, expertise in machine learning also that is very very important is we have a good collaboration with clinicians surgeon and those kind of expertise but at the end one thing is really really missed here is we may have so many good models good uh, equations that it works very well but we don't have enough people they have a good background in knowledge translation said you know now that you are saying you made a model you presented for 50 people or 100 people in a meeting does this uh, does this can be used by community i'm not sure i'm not sure we need some people fill that gap and send that result to the community also I mean, still we need some expertise, some people with this kind of uh, interest that comes and help us for next step. I wanted to explain one of the application we had using machine learning in a spinal cord injury. You know, whatever I'm talking today is about the field I'm working, but of course it can be generalized to any other application also. We had a data set that we had around 1,200 people. They come to Vancouver General Hospital with a spinal cord injury. And we have a registry there, we call it RISCER, Rick Hansen Spinal Cord Injury Regist uh, Registry. Uh, we call it RISCER. And I think maybe some of you, they kn you know Rick Hansen, that he had a spinal cord injury by himself and he such as he's such as Terry Fox and go around the country and trying to fund this kind of research we do there. Anyway, we had around 1,200 samples. We divided sample in two parts. One part for making the model and, uh, and one third of data for validation. I mean, at first, we use 60% of data to make our model. Then in rest of the data, we validate if it works or not. And it, it was uh, aligned with the time that they comes to our study. But what was our outcome? What we wanted to uh, find, we were interested to see who might die very soon in hospital. In hospital mortality, one year mortality, and long-term mortality. If somebody is in a risk, for mortality, it's good at first place you find that person. And although we wanted to treat all patients equally, but if somebody is in a very, very high risk, you may give priority more to that person to be sure that if he, if he or she is in a risk, you do something, prevent mortality in advance. We had so many variables in our uh, database but after talking with uh, expert people clinician and other researchers we decided to use few of them but fortunately you have a clinical back you have a medical background and so many of them are completely familiar for, for you and one of the variables we use was age and another was neurological severity i mean uh, different severity that people have when they have a spinal cord injury. You saw some of them, they are sitting on wheelchair. Uh, they might be HIA that they have a, a lot of limitation, but some of them, they have a less uh, severity that we call it HIA, B, C, and D is a, uh, usually less severe situation that people may walk just they may fall from the bed or at night at home but uh, still they have a good uh, capability to come hospital by himself or herself and another variable we used was neurological level that where it was happened it happened the cervical part of the body or thoracic of the uh, 
spinal cord injury. Also, another thing is stability of a spinal column that they call it AO spine morpho morphology. And another abbreviated injury scale score that is related to the place that they had injury also. I mean, they may have an injury on a spinal cord injury, but they may have an injury on face also, or their neck, or abdomen, or other places. These kind of things also was uh, were included in the model. Before going to the artificial neural network, just I explain a little bit about biological neural network. As you know, in our brain, we have a, a lot of neuron. They connected to each other, and they're trying by connecting to each others help us to make a decision. We have, a one, we have around 100 billion neurons that they have one trillion connection to each other. And you can see it's a very, very large network that it is not easy to replicate, but might be, it might be an uh, ultimate goal for us to make it such a very big uh, neural network. We use same uh, pattern to make artificial neural network. What we do, we have a, a couple of layer that we call it input, hid, input layer, hidden layer, or output layer. That input can be the variables that I'm using, for example, age, or sex, or uh, severity of disease. And hidden layer is several layer that help us uh, to increase complexity of the model to see how those variables should be connected to each other to be used for next layer that is the last layer, is the output. That can be, for us, it was a mortality, but can be anything else also. We used one of the, those techniques that we call it a neural network that, as you can see, we put all of our variables, age, abbreviated injury scale, neurological level, AOS, severity of the disease, and AOS point morph morphology. And I simplified uh, the model we used. Uh, the model was more and more complex than you can see here. And we connected all those things together and go to the mortality, to predict mortality. As you can see, here we may have a 1,000, 2,000, even more equations. But if you take a look at the traditional way of making equation, I mean, a statistical model, you may have just one model. You are trying to connect age, abbreviated injury scale, and everything else to predict mortality. But what we do in a statistical approach, we assume they have a linear relationship, but they may not. They may have a nonlinear. In that case, this kind of modeling might be more helpful. We applied this model, artificial neural network, and so many other models that I will not go to such a detail because it is, and it's, it's not very important at this moment. And by using those methods, we made our risk score for mortality. You can see for age, we ended up with four different categories. For people less than 45 years, we gave a score zero. For 46 to 57, a score three. And for more than 75 years, a score 10. And being Asia A was a score four and cervical level of injury, a score three. If they are cervical, if they are not, their score will be zero until last variables that it was a O, a spine morpho morphology. Overall, this scoring system gave us a score between 0 to 28. But how I can use this? When I have these scoring systems, now I can for I can use it for each patient to see how much he or she is in risk. And we, based on the methodology I explained, we made that uh, models and that is going systems and then now I have a patient I will ask the information or using chart to fill the information and I can see there is he or she score that I can uh, I can predict his or her probability of death I we compare we compare the model we made we call it SCIRS a spinal cord injury risk score with ISS. ISS is a 
another model that clinician made before, injury severity scale. And uh, as you can see, we compared one year mortality between the model we developed SCIRS with ISS. And it was around 30% difference. ISS we could achieve 55, but for SCIRS, the model we made, we could achieve our ROC that correct classification that who will die or who will not is around 83, 84, 86. It was same for in hospital mortality also. I wanted to show you one more example. Suppose somebody comes to the, our systems, his age is 75 and he's Asia A with cervical and AOS point C and head injury. His score will be something 21. I can put this line here and I can see uh, his probability of death for in hospital mortality is around 60%, for one year mortality is around 70%, and for long term 85%. But this is a very extreme case actually. For most of people, probability of death is very low. But depending the situation of person, we are able to make different uh, calculation and different probability. What we found here, we found that, you know, Using this kind of methodology, machine learning, AI can help you to explore something in your data that usually is not easy to detect by yourself. You saw the category of age. It was not easy to make such a category, category by a statistician or by a clinician. They usually, they go to the conventional way of categorizing age. But machine learning gave us different and different category. Also, they gave us different a weight or a score as you saw in our model and our model easily beat the conventional way of the predictive mortality that usually people use ISS and almost 30 percent stronger than the conventional way it seems machine learning has a good capability of to be used for other approach for other uh, clinical domain, but needs some people to do and have a good data. And the very, very important part is, suppose you have a model, you have a model and you uh, published your model, you presented your model in a meeting for 100 people, 200 people, but at the end, people may not use your model. You just publish for yourself somehow or very, very small community. If some people come, they can help you to go one step further, that will be very, very interesting. And I think one of the, uh, ex one of the things you learn the, in, in this uh, duration of the learning opportunity at Bay River College might be helpful to fill this gap. And, you can come and uh, help people to go one step further because a person such as me or another researcher when they publish something they feel they are done but actually it doesn't seem they are done it's still more work should be done but somebody should come that has a just this kind of interest knows whole process know how manage the project and know that end of the project is not is not that um, is not just publishing something or presenting something. It's overall review of what we did here, and uh, thank you for listening for what we presented. I we worked and I presented here. I'm more than happy to answer any question you may have. Anyone? <laughs> Bueller? Bueller? Anyone? No? Okay, I, I've got a couple of questions. Um, one yeah. is, is uh, you know, through the research that you've done and that, um, I, I, do, do you think that we'll ever achieve uh, unity with uh, AI? What is me? What it means, Leonard, by well, unity? Where uh, the art of the AI uh, achieves uh, full consciousness. Uh, 
you know, the, back in the 40s, like, as you're explaining, you know, when it kind of all started, and of course the mathematician Alan Turing uh, came up with this test, uh, the Alan Turing test, and uh, to, you know, uh, uh, for people to tell whether if uh, they're talking to a machine or a human being um, uh, uh, on the other end of the teletype, as to say, right? Uh, yes. So, yeah. <clears throat> but uh, now that experiment's kind of flawed now, you know, or, or is thought experiment's kind of flawed in the sense where... Uh, you know, machines can actually mimic uh, uh, humans pretty good, um, but uh, do you think we'll ever achieve like full unity where uh, they'll, they'll almost like have a consciousness kind of thing? You know, you no, know, no. That was a very difficult question and good question. Also, there is a expert in this field. They call him Michi uh, They called him Michael Jordan. He's a professor of the AI at Berkeley, University of California of Berkeley. He and a lot of people, and including myself, I, I think still we are not in a stage of the completely replicate what a human do. What we do is really machine learning, is not AI is we we have something such as Sophie as a robot that we think are similar to us, but they can do just part of the work we are doing. It is the question that I think we need more times, more time to be able to answer this question. We should see the progress of the field and direction of that uh, progress. But but it seems it might be possible. It seems it might be possible. Although I'm not 100% sure that we will see that, but maybe it can come in a one generation, two generation later. It will not be achieved very soon as far as I can see uh, the field. Oh, okay. And uh, now, as far as uh, building uh, uh, artificial uh, neural networks, uh, what kind of uh, technology are you using? Uh, is it like a FPGA or 3D ICs or DSP uh, processors or? It depends. For, uh, for some of our projects, we don't need a lot of computation and we use just a regular CPU that works for us. But for some other that when we are using deep learning, when we have a very, very large network. In our institute, we attach 16 computers to each other, 16 CPU, and we made a computer that has a GPU and 16 CPU also. And I couldn't reach the capacity that it has. Always it worked well. Even I run some artificial neural network with 10 million node. But you can see it's still I'm far from the brain that has a such a one trillion connection and 100 billion node. If we are far from, I we don't have any problem. And I also I applied this kind of methodology in Alzheimer because I work with those guys also. We didn't have problem with them also because it's still the data we have and number of variables we have is not problematic for us in a clinical field. I mean, when you're a student go anywhere, perhaps they should not have a problem. But for some institutes such as Google or Facebook, the amount of data is so different from us, they may have such a problem. But but we don't we don't have in a medical field, at least as far as I know at PC and the project we are running uh, have a problem. Oh, okay. So yeah, you're mostly using software emulation of the neural networks then like uh and uh are, are you using like a C++ or, or is it a Python uh, language or are you using a proprietary uh, pro programming language for this? 
It depends. For some project, when it is uh, easier to use, I'm using R. And you know, a lot of those model comes from the statistical uh, society. But for some of them that R doesn't work well, we have a very good program in MATLAB. I'm using MATLAB. For some of those, we are using Python. It depends to project and that a specific model we wanted to apply. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, MATLAB, that, that's a good language. And uh, found Python is kind of useful for that too. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and you're saying you're using the ARM uh, architecture, right? Uh, for, yeah. Yeah, and it's Honestly. a good processor. Uh, you know, for, uh, uh, you know, because it's uh, risk-based and that. So, uh, you know, very fast for calculations and that. Yes. Uh, definitely. And uh, uh, let's see. And, uh, oh, um, now you probably heard of the work that uh, is being done in Calgary uh, with the uh, neural chip. Uh, so are you using, um, you know, in, in the studies in UBC, are they using a chip kind of like that while integrating let's say uh connectionist ai so you put the chip uh on let's say the parietal lobe uh and um and uh, uh so of course the patient would send an impulse to let's say move their arm right and of course it would uh, uh transmit the um uh the pulses to the uh, uh muscles in the arm and uh and then using ai it would preemptively uh, or connection to ai would it preemptively uh, uh detect the next movement especially when let's say walking for example you know it's you know the whole mechanics of uh, uh one's gait is actually quite uh is quite unique uh it's like a fingerprint kind of thing right and uh and quite a complex uh mechanism uh, so uh, if you guys use like connectionist AI in like communicating with the parietal lobe? In, in our EC2, we don't use those kind of things as far as I know, because I'm, I'm working in a building that in our building, we have an EC2 that they call it eye cord, that most of the spinal cord injury research was done there. We don't use that, but I saw in one of the meeting people use those technology. It looks very interesting. But as far as I know, in our in our institution, in our building, we don't use. But I'm not completely aware of all uh, engineering department that they may use that that technology that I'm not aware. Right. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, anyone else has any questions? Anyone who has any question, just feel to pop in it in the chat. One question. Yeah, go ahead, Sarah. One question. So, um, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, Nada. Uh, sorry, uh, Sarah, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So, uh, we know that most of the time when we are talking about AI, we mostly talk about the benefits of AI. So, my question oh. is, uh, Dr. Fala, that um, what will be the risk of AI in the near future? Or will it be dangerous to a human life or no? It, it depends, Sarah. That's an important question. And so many people think about that. You know, you're, you're in a medical field. Your background is medical. Yes. You know how much we are different from chimp, from monkey? We, we are just 1% different from monkey, 1%. Our DNA is 99 99 percent same one one percent different that one percent different make us so smarter than monkey we made this kind of technology math philosophy art and the the life or you cannot compare our life with monkey suppose we make some sort of machine they are one percent smarter than us one percent not more one percent how we treat monkeys in our life how, how human treat you, you you know that how that people that species that they are one person smarter than us may treat us that 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 an option i'm always i'm thinking if some days we make a machine that they 
uh, they are a little bit smarter than us. How they treat us, you know, now there is a new type of uh, neural network that I don't go to the detail. They don't need any training at all. They learn things by themselves. Facebook did an experiment. They put those two machines in front of each other. They started talking English. And all people in machine learning expertise in Facebook, they understand how those two machines talk to each other. And they could predict. After a while, that two machines, they started talking with each other in another language that nobody in Facebook, they understood that what they are talking. Suppose you made a machine, they communicate with each other that we don't understand at all. And they started make something similar to each other. They don't need to be exactly as smart as the way we are. I mean, the cognition we have and language and other capability we have. But in a different way, if they are be smarter than us and more capable than us, that is something that we don't know what will happen to us. And some people, they warn, continuously they warn this kind of research we do that did we consider ethical aspect of this kind of things that we make a machine. And if you, if you offer me a model that is a little bit better than my, the model I'm using in this project, in next project, I will switch the model you're telling me because why I should stay with the model that is weaker. I mean, I do not consider at the end of the day, I may use something that at all I don't understand what it is, but it can give me better prediction. I, I mean, I will go a direction to be sure that I'm more successful, independent from that. Do, do I know what this neural network doing? That, that is not, I'm, I don't care. What I care is make a model that works very, very good and I can bring to the table a predictive model that predict patient outcome much, much better than the rest of the world. In that case, maybe unconsciously, most of us also <laughs> walking in a way that uh, we don't know what's the outcome at the end. I, I don't know, I, I, I answered your question or I confused you more with different things that may happen. Yeah, like uh, this made me uh, to bring like I have a lot of questions or a lot of uh, maybe lots of going on in my mind when uh, when you were uh, explaining me this question. So I was just um, researching on this a couple of months ago and uh, I saw uh, uh, like that's not a uh, like a, that's not a public post or nothing like that. So I was just Googling it and I was just seeing it. So I have seen that maybe in future, in the near future, the governments can use, can misuse this artificial intelligence. Like they can use as a weapon. They so can, they can. Maybe in that case, it will be very dangerous for us. Yeah, in fact, in uh, China right now, uh, if I can interject, uh, China right now, they're actually heavily using artificial intelligence to identify people. Uh, so like uh, facial recognition, of course, that's been done uh, for a while now, uh, but uh, they're also reading facial expressions as well uh, to tell whether, uh, um, you know, marking people, whether if they're going to be uh, sort of like aggressive or not, uh, or be a potential terrorist, uh, that kind of thing. So you're right, uh, Sarah, it, it is kind of getting scary. And even now, you know, you have uh, YouTube and, uh, you know, the other social media uh, platforms where, uh, you know, before they're kind of listening for keywords in that, now they're actually uh, uh, reading uh, and interpreting inflections of people's voices, uh, like the, the, the cadence and whatnot. And uh, to, to, to determine whether if that person could be uh, a potential uh, um, anarchist, as to say. Um, 
Uh, so before, you know, they were just listening for the key words, like uh, bomb or, uh, uh, or, or, you know, gun or something like that. Uh, but now they're actually, uh, uh, you know, analyzing the cadence of the voice, the pitch, the everything, right? Uh, you know, and you're right. It is uh, kind of scary because, uh, uh, you know, if you watch uh, some of the um, more right side of um, uh, uh, YouTubers as far as like uh, politics goes on the right side, uh, you know, they're all telling about this. Uh, so, you know, people like uh, Mark Dice and that. Um, you know, and it, and it is kind of scary. And, uh, I, you know, so even the U S government, uh, they want to, uh, have all these companies, these social media platform companies to, uh, you know, work better at analyzing people and their behaviors. Uh, so like, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, fellow was saying in regard to the two computers, uh, talking, uh, there was another project with uh, Facebook where um, uh, there was this one group. What they did is uh, they uh, developed this artificial intelligence that would uh, basically read through uh, the Facebook timeline and, uh, and then post uh, uh, replies to it, right? And uh, <laughs> so anyway, this artificial intelligence... Uh, uh, was set up to be like I think a 16 year old girl or something like that and uh, so she ended up being uh, uh, siding with um, uh, 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 Nazism and uh, white supremacy and that based on the chats uh, so uh, just through the machine learning and what she was learning through all the Facebook posts and uh, so you know, this AI just spiraled down into this weird rabbit hole uh, of uh, white supremacy, racism, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's, you know, so, you know, if we do achieve uh, unity, I mean, oh my God, what is this thing going to uh, think of, uh, uh, you know, the human race, right, uh, about us? Uh, and whether if we should give it certain rights and stuff like that, you know, constitutional rights as well. Uh, so it's it's something that I've been studying quite a bit uh, myself. Uh, or you remember those uh, Furbies? They're like these little dolls that kind of dance a little bit and, and they chatter. Uh, and they found out that uh, uh, they can chatter with one another and they can actually create a whole unique language, uh, just as uh, 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 Dr. Fellow was uh, talking about uh, earlier. Uh, and these things were made uh, back in 1992 or something like that. Uh, you know, I had one when, when I was a little kid. Um, yeah, so, yeah, it's it's kind of neat. And Dr. Fella, um, one other thing I'm kind of interested in is uh, the uh, psychological component of uh, uh, AI uh, in the sense where, um, you know, if uh, you mentioned that one robot, I can't remember her name, uh, where you can interact with her and she can uh, talk. Uh, you, and you had the picture of her as well. Sophia. Uh, yeah, Sophia. Yeah. And um, so anyway, have you ever encountered where uh, people actually kind of connect with the uh, uh, robot psychologically in the sense where uh, uh, they start thanking it, that kind of thing, and almost consider it as another being kind of thing? Uh now, there was a study done in Japan, for example, with the uh, uh, Simo ro robot that they use, and uh, there's uh, these other robots where uh, kids, uh, like school children, when they're playing with the robot, because how well it spoke and everything, so if the robot fell, for example, uh, the kids would have empathy for that, uh, uh, for that robot. Uh, have you ever encountered uh, any, any such uh, phenomena? I, I think that's very interesting, Leonard, you know, uh, we are, as a kids, we might be connected to the stuff we have, our parents buy for us, because our level of the expectation is that level. However, as you said, if a robot can go to the higher level and stimulate our uh, feeling, in that case, it it may not, not it may not be easy to ignore that person. Uh, 
because now it started communicate communicate with us and we we are feeling that you know without that uh, that's device we cannot uh, live easily that that might be possible but the also uh, if they are <laughs> unfortunately if they are smarter than us uh, that might cheat us also I mean it, it may not be easy to uh, to manage those kind of things did, did you see the movie of Ex Machina yes oh, I did yeah yeah, yeah. Did, did you see at the end what happened how that girl robot could could manipulate emotion of that one of the best programmer in the world you saw how how she did yeah yeah she was yeah. totally able to manipulate them based on yeah. the, the the emotions and that that uh uh you know she's learned you know over the time right because at least she was in the her, his level at least emotionally she was in the level of human that easily you know you can manipulate the human that that person was uh, lost his life because of the underestimate that capability of robot but but I think it is it should be possible and we don't need to necessarily completely understand the psychological aspect of human as far as we may give a basic to that AI machine uh, they may learn something by themselves if you ask me several questions about psychology basic psychology I may not know I cannot explain for you, but I know how to deal with other people. You know, and other people know. Even we don't have an expertise in psychology. We do not understand all components, but we learn from from something. Uh, we learn from our life that how we should deal with other people. And that case, uh, that case. I mean, it's not necessarily they know the basic, basic science of psychology. They learn how psychology can help them to communicate and make people addicted to them. And again, return to the Sarah question that uh, how we should deal with future of this kind of technology that can come and touch any aspect of our life psychologically emotionally so yeah. of course here i am i you know uh uh already you know i'm referring the ai like uh sophia as her she <laughs> yeah and uh yeah yeah so uh i you know and you're mentioning too where uh the younger the people are the the better that they adapt to it and uh and accept it right Yes. Uh, and identify with uh, uh, with the AI. Um, so yeah, good case in point there. Um, and um, uh, oh my God, I did have another question, but I can't remember what it was now. Oh my God. Uh, I think so now they with <laughs> us also. No, can you imagine the morning you wake up and you do not check your cell phone? And perhaps each of you are part of some social media, to Facebook. Yeah, well, you remember like uh, uh, Blackberries, right? Remember the yes. Blackberry phones, and uh, remember the name that uh, people used to call them too, Crackberries, <laughs> because they were like crack cocaine. You know, people were addicted, and uh, they actually did a study on like how often people check their Facebook uh, 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 stream, right? And yeah. uh, and it's something like uh, some people it's up to eighty times a day, you know. Uh, wow. Yeah, and it could be in part because of the artificial intelligence that they use to. Uh, it's almost like a, a gambling, right? Uh, yeah. You know, it's kind of like the eye candy. So uh, they preemptively know what kind of stories that you want to see and stuff like that. Uh, so of course you get addicted to it, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, and it's just like your mobile device listening in on you, too. You know, you talk about, oh, you know what, I, I think I'm going to uh, buy a new TV. And, uh, and all of a sudden, you start seeing these ads uh, on Toshiba, for example. And it's just based on 
uh, you know, where you're going and what you're doing, you know, so it's gathering all this GPS data, it's collecting, uh, uh, you know, what you're saying uh, to friends and that, and then, uh, you know, all of a sudden, you know, they're, you know, you don't even have to mention the brand name, you just think of it, and uh, you don't even have to mention it, that, uh, uh, you know, oh, gee, you know, uh, these RCA units are pretty good, are pretty cool. And then uh, all of a sudden, boom, uh, you start seeing the Walmart ads for on sale, you know, uh, RCA, yes. flat panel TV, whatever, you know, that kind of thing, right? Yes. Uh, so uh, they almost know what you're going to do before you even know it kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, so, will AI or the robots will have any half life or any? Uh, is there they will be having any survival rate or anything like that, or there will be no survival rate at all? Well, it depends. For our model, the you know machine learning we are using is some sort of AI. Is AI actually part of AI? No, they don't have survival. But but we continuously updated by ourselves because the model i showed you today it is something it was comes from my last year but now i have a completely different idea now i i am I, I think if i have few more variables if i apply another network instead of 10 million node if i buy something that i can run a network with 20 million nodes I may increase, you saw that my result, it was 85%. I may go to the 90%, 95%. Why not? I mean, I continuously update to sell my product as company they do. They continuously improve the car. They continuously improve their cell phone or software or windows that they know we are customer. We will pay in any way. In that case, uh, I mean, the nature of this kind of work showing that they don't care of survive, actually. They have a good demand that continuously people looking for new things. So we can manipulate, we can always manipulate it, right? So it, it, it is based on our needs. It should, it, it is possible, you are right, it is possible. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, Sarah, you just brought up a good point as far as like uh, us being able to control it. So, uh, and it was kind of weird because I was thinking about it at the same time. Now, uh, Dr. Fella, have you ever experienced any um, uh, uh, unpredictabilities where, uh, uh, for example, uh, the AI had actually changed its own code? Uh, so, for example, there's this one game uh, that uh, came out back in uh, the uh, I think 2010 or something. It's called Spore, S P O R E, and uh, and it's all to do with like simulating life. It's kind of like um, uh, Sim City, uh, uh, those kind of games where uh, you you develop this environment and uh, these organisms uh, that they, they eventually evolve. Now, uh, so some of the beta testers of this game. What they were doing is, is uh, of course, testing the game, uh, at, you know, putting it through its paces. And they ended up with uh, organisms that were totally unexpected. And uh, so later on, the developers, they went back into the code uh, uh, reports from uh, the beta testers, and it actually changed some of the code on its own. Yeah, there, there is a, some some sort of the neural network. Their job is just this. They generated code by themselves. And some of the things they do, it looks like funny to us. I saw some study they did. Looks like funny to us, but works very well. I mean, they do some sort of logic that works well, but we as a human cannot understand why you get such a decision but they have some capability you know suppose you and i we wanted to compete and go to the beach i obliged to walk on the street but you have such a capability you can jump from the house 
instead of walking there and have a clear path to the beach. And I feel this is what you are doing is funny, but it's not in my point of view is funny, but your work is more efficient than me because you reach in third of the time I reach the beach. Although I feel that is not, it may not be good, but that work and you get result faster, more efficient and better than me. I didn't do by myself, but I'm I'm aware that people are doing, especially some people at the uh, US and California, they are very interested in these kind of things. And then, well, uh, oh, sorry, Sarah, go ahead. Sarah, you have a question? No, I, at the moment, I don't have any questions. Okay. I still have a lot of questions, but yeah. I think time is not permitted. Yeah, yes, for sure. There's so many unknowns and it's a very interesting topic. Um, and I'm sure this will attract considerable policy effort, how we can put this into practice uh, and control it. Um, and, and in my field, I believe this will help greatly to at least accelerate medicine and drug development. So I so much look forward to more information. And Dr. Fella, thank you so much. We're coming to the end. Um, and you mentioned a great topic during your, your conversation, your presentation. You said that um, when, when scientists like yourself, you publish something, it's not for the sake of publication only. You want other stakeholders, other parties to come together and uh, see how this uh, reflect, uh, how this will reflect in the community. It's a, it's a very, very good point. Hopefully, um, we can tackle this one day. Well, thank you. I have a quick question. Sorry about it. So, uh, yeah, I think I think in one of these sites you have mentioned some mathematical uh, concept. So, I, my question is like, uh, does artificial intelligence include math in it or not? Because I'm very interested in this topic, but if it is in if math is involved, then I would definitely not consider it. It depends on situation. So if you are an end user, you may not know the whole detail. But if you are a developer, usually it assumes that you should spend a lot of time to learn math and start behind of all uh, equation and all type of modeling. Yeah. So uh, like as we learn about the uh, clinical research coordinator, like what will be the role will i get the job in artificial in intelligence um area or there are very less less or very few chances no no actually uh, it, i was trying to explain this i don't know how much successful i am i was i wanted to say you know you don't need to be an expert in machine learning as far as you can sell the product of machine learning people to the community and do something that help community can get benefit because community pay to us it is their right to use the result of our work but we stop somewhere some people should come and do these kind of things and to be sure that now they are using our result uh, if uh, the model i presented if i publish it but nobody use it it is not helpful we need somebody comes and go one step further, make an app, make a software, make a something available in all hospitals in Canada or around the world, and people use that as kind of model. We have a uh, problem for that part. In that case, I like this kind of uh, background you have, that you can come, you don't need to be expert in machine learning, but you can do something and bring those kind of things for community. They said, you know, this is a product. These people made, it looks, works, and so several other people also validated, not just ourselves, so many other people, they validated. Now I'm trying to bring it in community level and all hospital use it, all clinical uh, department, in ambulance, and those kind of people, but nobody did it actually. Tr recently we try, one of our work to make an app, 
make an app such as app you have in your cell phone. But it was just for one of our projects. I was involved in at least 20, 30 different projects, but none of them was turned to the app. I feel that there is a big gap. We need a help from people to come and help us for those kind of problems we have. Even, even some people may not appreciate that role, but it is very evident for me that is really important. Important and, and people, they don't know how much is good and how much is helpful to turn those investment, those money, time, work, investment to the real application. Yes, thank you. Shelly, thank you very much for this opportunity and managing the meeting. And it was very nice to visit all of you. And sorry, it was not enough time to go to the other question that other, other uh, student may have. But uh, I have my email address. If you feel there is something that I can uh, help, I'm more than happy to answer your question. Sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Fala, for your time. I know you have busy schedule. That's greatly appreciated. Um, yes, I highly encourage everybody to stay connected with you on LinkedIn or via email. And hopefully we um, have other meetings soon. Sure, sure. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Thank you Fala. very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Enjoy the rest of the day. You as well. Thank you.